Okay, this is August 21st, 2003, and doing another interview and interviews with Paul Kelly. I need for the record, tell me your name and how it's spelled, if you would please. Okay, I, I like to use the middle initial, so I'll, let's say I am Paul L. Kelly. Kelly is spelled K-E-L-L-E-Y. And uh, what, what other information should well, I? Well, that's, that's good for right there. Uh, um, what branch of the service were you in in I World was, War II? I was in the Navy. Well, I was, I was re, a USNR, in other words, in a Naval Reserve, but the Navy, I guess, would catch it. Absolutely. Well, tell me, when, uh, when was it that you became part of the military? Okay, I like to the question in that format because it gets a little complicated. I actually joined uh, a program called the V-12 program that uh, the Navy had uh, instituted, uh, which allowed you to finish your degree if you were close to getting your degree. And so that's what happened. I was able to finish up my degree in early 1943. I would not have been able to do that if I had to go into the Navy immediately. So you but, were in school where? At the uh, time? Here at Kansas State, yes. And then following finishing up the degree, I actually uh, took some graduate work uh, in the spring semester 1943. Uh, and from there, then went on to midshipman school at Notre Dame University. And then I was given a, uh, a commission in the U.S. Naval Reserve when I finished up the midshipman school. Let me back up just a little bit. I'm intrigued. That's mm -hmm. a V-12 program? Yes. And sometimes they, I've heard it called V-10, so it's, it, but it's roughly V-10 or V-12, but it actually was a reserve program that allowed students who were close to completion to complete their degree work so they would be eligible for the midshipman uh, training. Did you have to take an exam or something to no. qualify for it? Well, just an oral interview, but nothing other than that. Why the Navy? Oh, I, I guess being a farm kid, I would uh, thought the Navy would be a lot experience than joining the army directly so it was I didn't have a good rational reason but uh, I learned that there wasn't much there really but you did have a choice oh yeah well I, I didn't have it I had a choice whether I could have gone immediately into service and then taken the chance on my branch of service I would ultimately wind up in but but if I joined that V-12 reserve program then that definitely put me in the Navy slot when you were at, uh, and what year was that? It was early 1943. Were there a lot of uh, students at K-State that were involved in programs like uh, that? There weren't. Well, there was a substantial number. I, I don't know what the figure would be roughly. I never did see a figure on it, but there was a, the ROTC program here, of course, and uh, a good number of my friends, colleagues, uh, joined the advanced ROTC and got into the service via that route. But this was a Navy program, which was similar, but uh, they stressed different things. In other words, uh, we took a lot of work in navigation and things of that sort. And I guess they figured the Army knew where they were on the ground. But I'm not sure that was always true. But, but anyway, that's the way it worked out. Now, you say you took courses in navigation while you were in college? No. Well, or, or once you finally uh, got into the yeah, Navy? Yeah, some of the courses were indirect that, that contributed to navigation, like... Uh, courses in weather analysis and things of that sort. Uh, but uh, this was special work in old-time Navy navigation. We had very antiquated equipment. We had sextants and we had bowed each table and all that nonsense. And it took a long time to calculate a position, you know, and taking a sunshot or whatever. But you can do that in an instant now with modern computers. So back then you really could navigate by just looking at the stars and the position of the sun and the time of the day? And well, the, the best way was dead reckoning. <laughs> so you kept a pretty good accurate record of what course heading you went to for so many hours and then you made a rough estimate of your drift, you know, just like you would in an airplane. And as a matter of fact, later on, uh, we got to be quite friendly with some of the pilot navigator, uh, bomb bombardiers and so forth and they actually loaned us their aircraft navigational gear, which was much faster to use. In other words, you had to know your position pretty fast in an airplane. You had more time to figure it out on a ship. So, but at any rate, we got along fine. Interesting. Um, why is it that you did some graduate uh, studies at Notre Dame? Uh, I would think that once you graduate mm -hmm. from case. No, they weren't graduate work, but they were special training for the Navy. Oh, okay. Which would include more work in navigation. I see. Uh, this sort of thing. And, of course, drilling, which everybody gets their share of. <laughs> Did you have to wear a uniform? 
in, in, the, in Notre Dame, we did. We had midshipmen's uniform, which was, you know, the dungaree whites and that sort of thing. What was the uh, attitude of the of the other midshipmen uh, about the war effort? Maybe eagerness to get into combat. What, what was the general feeling amongst all of you? Uh, I think it was similar no matter what branch of service you're talking about. I don't think anybody had any special interest except uh, if they had an interest. Uh, uh, they really didn't know what they were getting into on, on any branch of service, frankly. Uh, so uh, I guess it was a flip a coin idea, really. I'm, I'm curious, uh, in 1940, you know, after Pearl Harbor, there were a, a great number of movies that were made by Hollywood that were very patriotic in nature, uh, that uh, I guess glamorized uh, naval service on battleships and aircraft carriers mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, PT boats, things like that. Mm -hmm. Did that have an influence on the way people thought? I, I don't think so because they actually had no first-hand experience of, of that. Uh, and most kids, you know, there weren't very many movies of that type around as far as I can remember. And even if there were, we couldn't afford to go to them. Uh, you know, they, uh, admission was a dollar uh, per person in those days for a movie, and that was a lot of money. But uh, I think mainly it, uh, it was just uh, an interest in seeing something different. and. Uh, most of the, I had no idea what you really were getting into when you were talking about any kind of a Navy ship, you know, the, the one cliche that became quite common once you had had some experience in actually wartime duty is that you can't dig a foxhole very fast on those steel decks. And, uh, and many a night we, you know, when we were uh, under uh, attack by Japs and so forth at night, we would sleep on top of the deck uh, there so if you know if you had a if you got a hit or something you'd have a lot better chance of escaping than if you were down in the bottom of the ship somewhere and couldn't get out so we, we would sleep on the deck and take a life jacket for a pillow and we didn't have a mattress <laughs> probably a lot cooler oh well it was because it, uh, there wasn't any air conditioning in the ships in those days they had fans and that sort of thing to keep air moving but there, air conditioning wasn't even heard of but we got used to the climate after about four or five months. Your your blood chemistry changes and a few other things. And wow. So, so uh, after you uh, had your schooling at Notre Dame, mm -hmm. uh, then were you commissioned into the Navy? Yes, we were commissioned in, in as ens ensigns to start out with, just like any other ensign, whether you went to the Naval Academy or anything else. But How'd you feel? Excuse me? How'd you feel being an ensign? Oh, it wasn't anything sophisticated about it because you were on the ship. Well, it depended on what ship you were assigned to. Uh, you know, there was the classical Navy, the big battleships and the cruisers and destroyers and all that. And then there was the amphibious crew, and I called it Halsey's Forgotten Navy. Uh, we had about 60 crew members or something of that order. And on a ship that small, you, you got to know everybody and you trusted everybody because your lives depended on each other. and. Uh, so there was this old cliche, you know, one hand for the ship and one for yourself. And uh, that referred to the fact that almost all ships had uh, some kind of protection so you wouldn't get washed overboard on the side or either be a steel chain with a post every so often or some kind of protection. Otherwise, you, would, you, you could easily get washed over, uh, overboard on a small ship particularly. That was less of a problem probably on the bigger ships, but uh, we didn't have that luxury. Being a Kansas uh, farm boy and mm -hmm. from the, the Midwest, uh, did you take the ships? Did you take, I, I guess when I say a ship, I'm talking about the big ships, yeah. and then you've got the smaller boats. Did you get seasick? Was that a problem? Uh, well, it, it, it was a problem for some people, but I never had any difficulty with it. And luckily, in fact, uh, and only to recently I never had any problems with seasickness. And as a result, lots of times when we were underway in heavy seas, I, I had the, the job of, we called it conning the ship, which is the same thing as being a pilot in an aircraft. And I got duties two or three days on end constantly sometimes because I was the only one that, that could still keep their cookies down. <laughs> and uh, and that, that's quite an experience so if you've ever been in heavy seas where the waves are 10 to 12 feet high. And, you, and it was quite common to be in convoy and you could uh, You'd look around, and, and when you were on top of the wave, you could look around to see where all the other ships were, 
and then when you went down, you couldn't see anything but water all around you. So you had to kind of keep your eyes open all around you in that kind of sea situation. Because we were small and we would, we were like a cork bobbing around out there. And uh, but by, by the way, I, uh, we didn't have any choice as to what ship you're going to wind up on. You turned in your preference, but the Navy decided where they wanted to put you anyway. So. What was your preference? Uh, I, I didn't have any major preference for a bigger ship. Uh, I, I was interested in something, you know, destroyed or all out, but I wound up in uh, the, we would, some people would call it a garbage scout type <laughs> ship, but what they did, they converted uh, uh, a landing craft, an LCI landing craft, to a gunship. In other words, it took off the uh, uh, troops landing gear, which uh, when you were coming in for landing with troops on board, uh, they would run those ramps down, and at least that kept the troops out of the real deep water, but they still might be up to their necks in the water. But they took all that off, and they rearmed the ship. They put a three-inch gun on it, and they put two 40-millimeter aircraft guns on, uh, two 20-millimeter guns, and then half a dozen machine guns. And so the, it, the whole idea was uh, uh, when I got overseas in the Solomon Islands area, particularly around Guadalcanal and that whole area, uh, the, the, the Japs were pushing us all around in those days, and they, they didn't, but we gradually then began to get the upper hand through, uh, through MacArthur's island hopping scheme. But our job was to, uh, we were actually assigned to the Army General in the area, we, you know, so we lost any direct contact with the Navy, and our job was to scout out about 200 miles ahead of the landing areas for the troops, make sure the Japs didn't come in behind the beach uh, and attack our GIs from the from the sea that way, and also to prevent uh, any uh, reinforcement of ammunition and and food supplies for the Japs that were further up on the island. But at any rate, MacArthur's island hopping strategy and, and whoever else wants to claim credit for it really saved a lot of GI lives. What did you think of MacArthur? Well, uh, he was the main, main idea. I don't think anybody, we never did see him, of course, and you, you heard about him and all that, but uh, uh, I, I think most of the GIs thought that, that that strategy made a lot more sense than trying to occupy a whole island, just occupy a, per, a airstrip perimeter and then leave the aircraft. That way, that made, it was equivalent to having another aircraft carrier if you had a, an, an airstrip on an island and have the island properly uh, uh, surrounded uh, on a perimeter, and then our job was to keep any Jap infiltration coming in from the beach side, and also to prevent any uh, uh, reinforcements of Japanese troops that were further up on the island. So essentially what MacArthur's strategy was just to simply starve out the Japs and, and just leave them there. And that made a lot of sense. There wasn't any point in clearing 50,000 Japs on an island if they couldn't eat. You know, they, the food supply would take care of them. So. But at any rate, that was uh, the main idea of, but as you know, if you re everybody that's familiar with the history of what happened to the, the Navy out there, the, uh, the U.S. Navy and, and the GIs were getting pushed around pretty bad early on, there wasn't any doubt about that. And, mm -hmm. and so the, the Navy was short of ships, and so the Halsey was the Navy commander in that area at that time, so uh, developing these uh, gunboats was a great, you know, uh, strategic idea and it uh, and provided, in other words, we would go out in patrol teams and we were actually a part of the uh, Kennedy's outfit, uh, the PT. We worked with the PT boats, We'd, a patrol mission, we, we, we would patrol at night. We didn't worry about the daytime because the aircraft could take care of problems in the daytime. But we would set up patrol teams. We'd take two gunboats uh, and we'd take two PT boats and then either some kind of aircraft, either B-25 or PBY or some of those, and that made up a nighttime patrol team. And it was a pretty effective uh, uh, patrol team because uh, PT boats carried torpedoes. Uh, we had anti-aircraft protection in our armament. And of course, the, the airplanes could carry bombs. So uh, the Japs didn't mess with you, you see. They, they knew they, they didn't, well, they, a bigger ship like a Japanese destroyer might play around with doing something about it, but we never had uh, that misfortune. We were able to, they just stayed away from us. Yeah. I was uh, just thinking back that the turning point with the Japanese strength in the Navy came at Battle of Midway.
And after that point, they just didn't have the power and the presence that they did prior to that That's time. That's true. Yeah. Um, in your experience, did you encounter much Japanese uh, uh, naval resistance and that, or was that just kind of a fleeting enemy? Well, uh, they, they, we, they were starting to leave when we were able to get these teams, but I mean, you could see that there was less contact. But uh, if the Japanese wanted to come down with a big fleet, we, we couldn't have stopped them. There's no way. And they did that early on. And so, uh, they, for all practical purposes, they figured that they had us locked in until we had enough of these patrol teams uh, developing and uh, uh, that, that eventually changed, changed things around. But I, I think uh, the, the main thing I would argue that uh, training was pretty important. The most important, we didn't use navigation very much. You could f feel your way around and use dead reckoning and all that. But the main thing was the, I call tactics. The most important thing we learned at uh, midshipman school at Notre Dame was the, the simple tactics. In other words, it was a very famous naval maneuver called crossing the T. Uh, well, without getting into all the details of that, uh, I was on charge of the, this flotilla f on duty one night, and we picked up a radar contact. We did have radar, and very few ships had that. But we picked up this contact. We knew it was Japanese, so there weren't any Americans around. But anyway, we were able to set up uh, a t crossing T maneuver, and we were able to get the first fire off at this Japanese gunboat. And uh, as a result, we sank it. Uh, but the, the, it was really a, a stroke of luck that uh, we came out with, without any fatalities because we got the first shot. And the ordinary place what I used to be standing for on general quarters duty was behind a 20 millimeter gun shield. It has pretty heavy armament, but they put a shot right through there where ordinarily my belly would be. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, just pure luck. I escaped because I was conning the whole outfit that night. Yeah. If I hadn't been on duty, I would have been down there with that 20 millimeter gun and I wouldn't be interviewing you here today. <laughs> But, or it's the other way around, I guess. <laughs> the ship that you were on, now, it was a ship or a boat? Um, the it, amphibious it, assault. It's uh, sacrilegious to call it a boat. It's okay. a ship. <laughs> I'm an army guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anything, a boat is carried on a ship. <laughs> okay. That'll take care of it. I didn't know that. Well, that's the easy way to distinguish it. Okay. But, the they, but that's not 100% correct because they used to call them PT boats. Right. So we didn't we didn't get hung up on that. Well, tell me about the the ship that you were on. Okay. And, uh, how it, you, you said it was uh, a landing craft. Yes, that converted. converted. Yes. How many? What kind of a crew did you? Have? We, we we had a crew of about thirty. I suppose. Thirty. It was very little bit because we see we had to maintain an engine room crew, fire assist guy. and then we had gun recruit. It take uh, quite a few guys to man all those guns in general quarters. So we'd run about 30. So we, we, didn't, we didn't carry very many troops. It would be very rare that we'd be carrying troops. The, uh, the only time we would exceed our own numbers was sometimes the, uh, there was a hospital on uh, Bougainville, which was a, in the Solomon Islands on the northern end of the chain that we used to work with. And, uh, and when things settled down a little bit, the doctors there would like to sometimes to go out on patrol with us at night because, you know, that gave them a little bit of, change of duty, which uh, was probably illegal, but uh, uh, but most of the time we'd run about 35 or 40. So the ship that you were on then was a true offensive warship? Yes, yes. And not a carrier of supplies and troops? No, no. It was essentially what, what they were trying to do. We were an element in a patrol activity. In other words, if you would, if you took the PT boats by themselves, uh, there were problems with PT boats, uh, you know, a single shot uh, could set up all the fuel and you'd blow up. And they were made of wood. Uh, they were made of wood, and they, but they carried torpedoes. Right. And so if they had protection from ground, act, I mean, surface activity, which we could give with our three-inch gun and, and so forth, uh, and we had radar, and of course some of the PT boats had radar, but not all of them. But at least we could, we could find out the targets that might be offensive targets for uh, trying to get at the PT boats. Because that's what happened earlier on when John Kennedy's PT boat got ran by a Japanese destroyer. They didn't have that kind of protection. You know. If they'd had a crew uh, like we were later on using, they would have known the Japanese destroyer was in that area, but they had no way of knowing it. 
Did you know of John Kennedy's exploits at that time? No, and you know, and, and uh, we didn't even—I didn't even know that until maybe a year later after when I got back to the states. But uh, but we definitely worked. We were part of that. The the PT boats came from the outfit. That, they had the PT, and down there, the general organization was all of the naval craft in that area were ultimately under the uh, authority of the local general, not the Navy directly. And uh, that made it a little hard to get food supplies once in a while. And Tell those, me about that. Well, we discovered how many different ways you could uh, eat ham, spam. In other words, you can boil it, you can fry it, you can bake it, and whatever. <laughs> and, but at any rate, uh, we we didn't have a very, of course it was unbelievable back in those days they would uh, stack most of the food supplies say down at Guadalcanal and early on some bright guy decided that, that the food that goes went to the army should have paper labels on it but the, by the time you saw it in the stacks out in the jungle all the labels had been gone so if you went down to get a truckload of canned food supplies you didn't know what you're going to wind up with uh, but uh, at any rate it worked out. We. There was a lot of canned juice and canned fruits and whatever, but you know, you just took your chance on what you're going to have for lunch or d dinner or whatever that night. Was that pretty much the rule throughout your entire stay down there? That oh, yeah, it, it was that way because you'd go out and, you know, they'd stack the cans of food. And they, they, you know, the rains was just terrific down there. The paper boxes that would be off in one good big rain. So you just went to a pile of cans and just loaded up a half a truckload of tin cans and hope you came out with something useful. Was there a pretty good black market in uh, somebody that had uh, cans that no. had actual food in it? Well, they all had food in it. Uh, you know, the paper labels were gone. You didn't yeah. know what you were getting until later on. They, some guy decided maybe it would be a good idea to print uh, in a non-washable print what was in that can. Uh, but uh, the, and of course the biggest problem is we, we couldn't use any uh, fresh meat supplies or anything like that. We didn't have refrigeration. And so we, we were spam eaters. And Did that create uh, health problems? By, no, we didn't. Did you have plenty of fresh fruit at times uh, too? Well, it, we never had any fresh fruit. The only thing we lived on was it, it was in a can. It was right. either canned juice or it was spam or canned beans or whatever. But, you know, if you get hungry, you, you eat most anything. And uh, I, I don't recall anybody ever saying they were terribly hungry. Uh, you know, they just made do with uh, canned juice. You know, we had a lot of juice, luckily, and that, that, that worked out pretty good. Were you the uh, captain of your ship? I, I, I was scheduled, to, uh, I, I was ex second in command. Executive officer. I started out as low as you could get as a gunnery officer, and then, but then I was scheduled to come back to the state. Well, I came back to the states right before the the war ended, and I was scheduled to take a ship then to go to Japan. They didn't tell me that, but we knew that's where we were going to go. But um, what does a gunnery officer do? Well, mainly you, you, you make sure that the guys at least know how to operate the guns. And uh, when you had a little spare time, you go out for gunnery practice. But I would, I my hats were off to the airplane pilots that would f fly these. They would they would tow a float, you know, behind, and you'd, then of course you were. They were supposed to <laughs> try to hit that thing. Well, gee, lots of times they came awful close to the airplane. And I, but anyway, luckily nobody got shot down. <laughs> but it, it, you wondered sometimes whether that was a smart idea. I yeah. bet you had a chief petty officer around that knew how to take care of things and they took care of you. Oh, yeah. The, the, the main, I, there were two guys at least in the petty officer, Gary, that they taught me more about the Navy, how to handle a ship than all the Navy did. And they, they were great. The, one of these guys operated a boat up in New York Harbor, and he knew how to handle a ship inside and out. Of course, it was kind of interesting to come alongside a Navy ship to take on water or something, and uh, be a uh, U.S. Navy, regular Navy guy there who had never had charge of a ship, and here some shaved tail GA like me was bringing the ship along, and tying it up to a destroyer or whatever to take on water or or food supplies and so forth. But we, we had to learn, but these, these petty officers taught us, and they were just first rate. And, but the whole crew, I would go there in the world with the crew we had. They were just absolutely terrific bunch of guys. Uh, a lot of them uh, didn't finish high school, 
but uh, and a lot of them came from the south. They, they liked to hunt, and they were dead eyes with rifles. In fact, lots of times we would be on a, a floating mine patrol activity, and, uh, and they could pick those mines off of the, that were floating, you know, that had broken loose from a weight cable. That they were supposed to be lower under the water. He couldn't see them. But uh, at any rate. The, the, what was life back uh, like back at the... Uh, Port base. What were, were your? Uh, well, we had a base camp. Uh, if you're familiar with the, there's a major island called Tulagi, uh, just off of Guadalcanal, and that was our base camp. That's where Kennedy's group was headquartered and all that. And so that's where you were at. Yeah, we we would go out day. for about six weeks at a time, but by that time you need to ref you needed to refueling, because we would hide out in the daytime. We didn't patrol in daytime. It was a all nighttime patrol. And uh, um, but at any rate, about every six weeks you come back and you could restock your food supply and your fuel supply. How did you hide out during the day when? Uh, well, was mostly it assumed that the Japanese didn't have the aerial supremacy to see you from the air. They they they, they still were a problem. Uh, we we would uh, go up in a little. There'd be little rivers in the islands, and we would go up a little river, and the the, the overgrowth is so dense there. That, that pretty well covered you, and then we had camouflage netting, and we'd string that up a little bit too. But uh, at any rate, we, we, that's, we didn't want to invite them. They could find us if they had a radar, but uh, they, they, I don't think they had radar Did to you, any great extent. I mean, on the small sh Jap ships. Right. Did you uh, have any contact with the indigenous populations? Uh, they, we were careful uh, at the home base, like in Tulagi, uh, what they, the Navy and the Army moved all of the, in, the local natives into a compound. And it was just strictly forbidden to go near the compound. Like an internment camp? Yeah. But, you know, they, were, they could carry on their normal activities there and, and so forth. But, uh, and, and then the Navy and Army gave them food and so forth, so they didn't have to depend on fishing and so forth. But they were concerned about, uh, you know, health problems, uh, too many pick up uh, diseases that were ed endemic to that part of the world and so forth. But they were isolated. When you were, I'm intrigued by going out uh, for six weeks at a time on mm -hmm. patrol, mm -hmm. hiding out during the day, mm -hmm. which pretty much I would suspect restricted activity. What did you do for recreation? Well, most of the time you slept because <laughs> uh, you'd be tired pretty well. But uh, the biggest recreation of the crew was uh, uh, gambling, and there's one, and uh, there was a considerable transfer of resources. <laughs> and I was, we had to check every letter and everything you know that was sent home, make sure it didn't deal with any wartime secrets. And uh, at any rate, I know one young fella. I kept track of it. He sent home ten thousand dollars. From, that he won from Gannon. So if you wanted a course in uh, uh, any kind of poker, why we had the expertise on deck. <laughs> so. Was gambling discouraged? No. No. We, uh, you know, the guys, most of the guys didn't let it get out of hand. And it was only, we didn't have TV and, and uh, we didn't have a radio early on. So we didn't know what was going on in the States or anything like that. So I finally decided that was dumb. So I, t I talked uh, the radio operator to going ashore with me, and we went over to the, near the air base, and I talked uh, some of the local technicians into giving me the radio out of a uh, aircraft that was there, down you know the shot up aircraft, and he was able to convert that to where we could receive San Francisco. So that made a big difference. We didn't have you know the bigger ships, of course, had good communications. They had newsletters and all that. We didn't have anything like that. Did you ever listen to Tokyo Rose? Oh yeah, they're on every night. Yeah. I've always heard that uh, you obviously didn't believe things oh. that she said, but the music was good. The music was good. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, we just laugh at that stuff, you know. <laughs> the only problem I had was uh, with the radio. Uh, the, it it kind of shook me up on that. But the U.S. also engaged in some propaganda, and I didn't know that until I actually heard it. But out of San Francisco, they would uh, describe an action which we were actually in locally. And they painted it up as we had had a terrific victory, where in, in fact, reality, we, it was probably a draw. Things like that. that. That bothered me a little bit. But, you know, I, I have never seen a good book in reading. I am kind of 
interested in looking this up, but I, but I, I see if there was ever any major research uh, that uh, discusses that sort of drift in intelligence. That, uh, it, it bothered me when you could hear the San Francisco describing our action, and it wasn't quite right. I was 27 years as a public affairs officer and a disseminator of information, and I can understand some of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, for the people that were on your ship, uh, what kind of disciplinary problems did occur? We had absolutely almost zero. Really? Unbelievable. You had all angels. Well, sure. No, they weren't angels. <laughs> and, but the fact is you, you had to have a camaraderie here. You had to respect everybody else because you were in it together and your life depended on the other guy watching you and saving you, you see. In other words, if a guy slipped or something and would, I mean, potentially could wash overboard, boy, you were there to pull him off and, and get him back on the ship, you see. But the, we, we only had, well, maybe a couple health problems, you know, mental cases where they just couldn't stand it any longer. And the minute I saw that happening, I just asked for a transfer for the guy to go to shore. I didn't want him on the boat or the ship, either one, because mm -hmm. it was dangerous to himself. And I only had two cases out of about 40 crew. I thought that was a pretty good record. And, uh, but everybody helped each other. We didn't have a serious, at least I would have found out about it on a ship that small if there was any aggressive actions back and forth. But the, everybody was looking out after the other guy because the fact that he was or they were there also uh, pr protected you, you see. Was alcohol a problem? No, because you couldn't get it. Uh, they you didn't uh, have any private stills? Well, yeah, <laughs> they did have one. They drained the alcohol out of the compass one time. <laughs> I couldn't believe they would do that. But in fact, in this little ditty I'm writing, I've got a write-up on that. But one time I kind of figured I wanted the guy to take a bearing off of the fantail compass. He said, I can't, it won't work. <laughs> I went back and looked at it and it had been drained dry. So after that, I had a little discussion with the crew that that was a problem if we were out and trying to figure out a heading on the high seas for some legitimate purpose. So, But, but actually what happened, they, they would give you a, a beer ration. And the problem was with that, it was a nonsense idea because if they drank it all at once, they'd be half polluted. So we made a deal with the crew, I did. Look, I said, let's take the total green beer ration but let's stow it in an empty um, uh, bulkhead that, that we got the fuel out of there. And, and here's the, here's the, uh, uh, the, the, it's there. And if you promise not to mess with that while we're underway, every time we come to anchor, we'll draw green beer out of there. And they honored that 100%. Green beer. Well, it was beer out of Australia that wasn't quite beer. <laughs> They, they, they'd sell it before it was right, really ready. We called it green beer. But at any rate, that was amazing because the crew, they respected that, was be, that would be dangerous to be a half shot. You couldn't, your, your life would be at risk. And they, they honored it and they, they enforced it themselves. We didn't have to do it. So this that, is, at what you're describing is interesting to me mm -hmm. because I'm a product of watching all these movies that were done in Hollywood. Yeah. The hard drinking sailor, always in fist fights. That just and didn't drunk. exist. That just didn't exist. I'm not saying it didn't exist on some ship. All I'm saying it didn't exist on our ship or any of the grand ship. Uh, we had about five or six ships uh, that we worked together on. You mentioned earlier about uh, censoring the mail that it left yeah. uh, the ship yeah. for secrets and that. Was that your job? One of all, the, all the officers had to separate and you had to read the mail, which was a crazy idea. I mean, they could have gotten the whole mail bag and they wouldn't have learned anything anyway. I mean, the Japs knew everything they needed to know about our ship. And they, we didn't, and, and we didn't have access to any super intelligence. You didn't have to be bright to see what was going on. If you had a map of the Solomon Islands, you could see where you were at and what you were trying to do. We were trying to move up the chain, the slot there. So what kind of things did you uh, look for to either cut out or black out? Oh, technically, you weren't supposed to say that we had a three-inch gun on this ship. Well, the Japs knew that. We'd been shooting at them. <laughs> and they, they didn't think we were using a BB gun, <laughs> you see. So they, they could figure all that out. And during the daytime, if they sent an aircraft over, 
which they didn't, most of the aircraft, Japanese aircraft would come overnight. And they knew exactly what heights to fly so the 90 millimeters mortars or whatever uh, wouldn't hit them. And uh, all we, they go get the searchlights on them and you could see the bomb bay doors open. You'd count the number of bombs that were coming out. Then you'd count the number of explosions. And if they matched and you were still alive, you said it's all clear. So that's it was pretty simple technology. And, uh, but anyway, most of the guys knew that they weren't supposed to write that stuff, and we didn't have any problem with that. I thought it was a crazy idea. I mean, uh, anyway, but that was, the Navy thought they were doing something big, you know, to uh, strike out part of a guy's letter and something like that. How often did you receive mail? Oh, that was very, maybe every month or something like that. It wasn't very regular. Because we'd have to wait till we went back to the base and uh, depend on if it, who at San Francisco knew where Tulagi was <laughs> and all the little things. So, but we didn't get a lot of mail. On it, but, but the biggest problem, I think, was the lack of communication from the brass on down to what the general plan was, what, we're, what are we trying to do? And uh, there was, that was very bad. Did the skipper know pretty much what was going on? No, nobody at our level. Uh, if you went You out. knew roughly what was go going on. I mean, you know, that it wasn't very complicated to understand that we were trying to regain the Solomon Islands. Everybody knew that. But whether we were going to go to a whole other group of islands, we didn't have access to that information. Hmm. But, uh, uh, but in general, uh, the strategy that MacArthur used down in that part of the world, I, I thought was an excellent strategy, saved a lot of lives. And, uh, it also allowed him to uh, use what precious resources oh, sure, had, yeah. they were very limited. Yeah, yeah, from Priority a Priority was Europe. Yeah, it, it, was a, uh, it, was a, it was a smart move, and a lot of guys hated MacArthur and all that, but I, I'd have to say that uh, that was an excellent strategic move. The one, on the, then we had one, we called it R&R, &R, uh, I don't know exactly, I'd have to look up the date of it, but we got one chance to take the whole flotilla down to Sydney, Australia for about uh, a week's leave. And down there we got this one time, uh, a bunch of us were going to a local bar and here comes Mrs. MacArthur with her young son. Mm -hmm. And we had to have clear the gangway, you know, so that she could get through and all that. But, but she was real gracious about it and everything. So. But we never did see him. So the whole, uh, the whole ship's crew got to uh, go and enjoy Sydney? Yeah. Well, the, but the whole flotilla did, about, whole flotilla. about five or six ships or whatever. I don't remember exactly how many was in the group now. I've got that in some notes I'm writing. But. The Australians uh, pretty accommodating to all of you? Oh, yeah. They, they, they knew that uh, the Japs would be in Sydney if it wasn't for us. They, they, they were headed that way. But, uh, but I think the main thing, I think most people in the U.S. didn't realize how, how far uh, that the Japs had really moved until you could see it firsthand. They, 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 they about had that place all wrapped up. That's right. That's right. Uh, what was the most harrowing thing that happened to you when you were serving in the South Pacific? Well, I never did think about that before. Well, I suspect the, the most thing that, that struck me was that one night we had, I was, I think I mentioned, I was actually, what we call conning the ship, that meant you're like the chief pilot. Mm -hmm. And I, I was on patrolling and I had four or five, well, I guess it was three other gunboats that was leading, plus the BT boats and so forth. But the fact that we picked up this target one night and we were able to get off the first shots, I would probably rate it as one of the kind of scary things, because if they would gotten there first, they could have blown us up. Because, hmm. you know, we didn't have any armament that would protect anything. It was psychological. It would take care of BBs, but it, it wouldn't stop a major bullet. It just, and we had to stack ammunition on the top deck, and we couldn't put it down in the ship. Of course, you know, two or three rifle shots had hit that 40 millimeter uh, uh, can, canister of shells or whatever. It just blown the whole thing up. Of the time that you were uh, serving in the South Pacific, uh, what gave you the biggest adrenaline rush? Was it getting off the first shot and sinking that 
other ship, or was it some other event that I mean, everybody was just floating yeah. and flying because of uh, yeah. what had just occurred? Yeah, I don't think we ever thought of it in those terms. You know, you, you, when the, when the, if you, yeah. luckily most of the bombing was, uh, you know, at night sometimes we would be in the harbor area where the the, the perimeter, the, like on Bougainville, there would be a perimeter and there'd be an airstrip, and we'd be out in the harbor protecting the harbor entry. Uh, I, I suppose uh, seeing those Jap Bet Bettys coming over and dropping the bombs and counting them and all that, and then seeing uh, the all clear, uh, hearing all, all clear after you found that all the explosions had taken care of, and nobody got hurt. But uh, I never, I don't think, uh, I never felt that. I was getting hyped up particularly, I think you're just playing it smart because you, you, you got to think about going by the rules and yeah. the rules were designed to protect everybody. I, I, one or two times I remember one of the, one crew kid, uh, he was a, a machine gunner, operated one of the machine guns, he, he got so scared he kept holding on to the trigger to the barrel because it became red and you know that could blow up and uh, I had to just actually pull him off of the gun. But after a while, he settled down, and but he obviously was scared to death. So, but yeah. I don't ever recall being scared or anything like that. They were there, and nothing you could do about it. And the main thing is you try to beat them. This is might be a difficult question to answer, but of the time that you spent down there, of the things that you did. Of the things that you experienced, what are you most proud of? Well, I, I would say that the, the, the experience of working with other guys and trusting them and uh, being a part of that kind of a group, uh, I, I was really proud to be a member of that crew. I mean, I figured that I wasn't any better than any other crew member, and uh, but there was just a, a camaraderie that you, that you developed. You were. All, nobody was telling anybody else what to do. You just did it. You knew what you had to do. And uh, that was a f unique experience. This uh, video that we're doing is for historical purposes mm -hmm. to talk about a wide, wide range of things. Hopefully scholars throughout the years will have access to the material, mm -hmm. which leads up to this question, which again, may be difficult to answer. What thing occurred that you are least proud of? Hmm. Well, uh, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm least proud of, but I think the, uh, uh, it was a tragic experience for the crew and the ship, uh, was that our uh, skipper had a mental breakdown. And I will swear to this day uh, that the, the movie that was made by Humphrey Bogart had to come from <laughs> that experience. Really. Because uh, I never heard of, uh, uh, well, what it, what the it turned. Mutiny. Yeah. yeah, the came mutiny. Uh, what had happened uh, was that we were getting ready to go into the invasion of Borneo, and um, you know there was a massive number of ships in the harbor and where we were staging the assembly. I forget the exact point of where it was, but it was the southern Philippines, I guess, or somewhere in there. But at any rate, uh, the skipper all of a sudden. Uh, we always had a deck watch, even in a relatively secure area, and he was armed with a 45. And of course, we could be at general quarters in a few seconds if we had to, because he could call it. But at any rate, all of a sudden I heard a few shots from a 45, and I knew something was crazy. So I rushed out, and the skipper had grabbed the 45 from the deck watch, and he was shooting up in the air, luckily. So I tackled him, and two or three other officers came running out of me, and we got the guy down and tied him up. So about this was about uh, one o'clock in the morning, and so we we couldn't use radio silent uh, radio because we were under radio silent. But we sent a semaphore message to the commodore: "Look, we have a tragic experience. The skipper is incompetent. Uh, we must come and talk to you." So at the in the middle of the night, the second uh, in command skipper uh, there and I took a ro a dinghy. We call it a dinghy life raft. And we rowed over to the Commodore's ship, and we, as we got up to the uh, top of the landing, you know, the, um, the officer on duty said, you realize that if what you had sent on the seminar
yes, the semaphore is not true. This is a court martial offense. <laughs> we said, we realize that. But it said, we just got to get some action taken and have this guy technically removed from command. And so they believed us. So then they, they took a jeep lighter, which is a little landing craft, you know. That, anyway, and sent over about three, I think there were three, four stripers in the medical corps, and that's a lot of brass. In, in the Navy. Four striper. Four striper. They were not commander? commodores, they were uh, captains. Oh, captains, O sixes, okay, like uh, a colonel. Yeah, yeah. So, and then they had some line officers along, and so we rode back over there with them. And uh, uh, of course, they examined the guy, and immediately they agreed totally with us, and they took him off, and then took him to, to, for medical attention. But how else could uh, the Cane Mutiny have gotten the story? That actually happened. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that this one other officer and I that went over, we decided we had stored some scotch on board, <laughs> which they, we, you know, the airplane pilots we worked with always go to Sydney, they bring back Hagen, Hagen, whatever. But anyway, we had this stored in the officer's quarters, and we decided that well, obviously there's going to be an inspection of this ship. It wouldn't be a good idea to have that Hagen, Hagen line, so we dropped it overboard. I went outside and the guy handed it through the porthole and we dropped it all over the board and we carefully made a log of where, what the coordinates were. <laughs> but we never did go back to get it. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I, I guess the uh, least inspiring, you know, it was sad to see this guy uh, get in that condition. But it was tragic. We had to do something. How did it affect the uh, the crew? I'm oh, the crew was biased 100%, absolutely 100%. They, they, they stood behind us, and they, uh, when they, the, these investigators went around and talked, every one of the crew stood up for us right to the man. They said it was the only thing that could be done. And we saved their lives because he could have shot somebody. But, it, you know, that's what happens. Yeah. When you, when you look in subsequent years and... Uh, your time uh, as a professor and, 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 and all the things that you've done. What was it that maybe you got from your military experience that had an effect on your later life? Or was there well, any? Well, it definitely did. And I, I would argue that uh, the experience with the group of guys, and I think it was 99% the people we had to work with, but it sure taught me a lesson on how to work with people and get their respect and, and to respect them. And you know, you respected everybody on the crew. Everybody had a niche to play. And that person was the best person in that niche is the way I looked at it. And they could do their job, what they were assigned better than I could do it. And so we, we tried to create that kind of an atmosphere. They knew the assignment. It was up to them to do it in the best possible way and stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the key and uh, I'm sure sometimes in, uh, public universities don't always learn that idea. Uh, but it, it was a great training experience in working with people. I wouldn't, trade in, I wouldn't train, take anything for it. Have you kept in touch with some of the people? Uh, yes, but not as much as uh, I should. And in fact, what I'm trying to do now, uh, I decided that after about 100 years, it was time to write some of the stuff up. So what I've been doing is, and I've got a few notebooks here, every time I get an idea about a little section, I just write it. And, I'm, and then I'm assembling in a notebook, and then I'll try to put the notebook in some sort of order that makes some sense. But I'm more interested in just making a record right now. Of what Who's that record for? Mostly for myself, for grandkids and so forth, yeah. but hopefully for the crew. For the crew? For the crew. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've got addresses on a fair number of them, but uh, at any rate, uh, I thought it was a useful experience. and. Uh, uh, some high ups in the government encouraged me to do some writing on it in the Navy. So uh, if I get it cleaned up, I think it, I think there's some things that I, the most important thing that I got out of uh, the experience personally was that training does make a difference, and the right kind of training saves lives in the military. And not very many people believe that, but it's a fact. And um, I, I'm, I'm sure that the training that I got at Notre Dame. Uh, about the simple maneuver of so-called crossing T, which I actually had time to set up, it saved the crew's lives because they got the chance to get the first shots off and, and they could concentrate the firepower, which you, you couldn't otherwise. And so things of this sort. 
So I'm a great believer in training. Right. And a lot of people say, why keep up all this training with military? And it makes a difference. That's right. And uh, When you were mustered out of service, what was your rank? Uh, I was a Lieutenant JG. And then I had a chance to take get full lieutenant deal, but that would have meant I would have to go to summer training camps and so forth. And I said, I've had enough Navy. <laughs> yeah. um, when the grandkids ask you, Grandpa, tell me about World War II, tell me I about get, your I, experiences. I get this. <laughs> yeah. What is it that you want to tell them? Well, you, you know, I, I don't think they're interested in all the tactical stuff. I think the main thing that I try to convey to them, which, if I can, is that, uh, gee, if you get to know these people, you'll find out they're terrific if you, if you know what they're good at and what they like to do and then that you treat them like a human being. And we just absolutely had, uh, I'd say, a rankless ship in the terms of this nonsense of saluting. We didn't salute. Nobody saluted. And you had a job to do, and they respected that had that responsibility and they were out to help you. In fact, lots of times, one time, as an example of that, uh, we would bring the ship in for repairs and one time at, at Tulagi uh, Harbor, which is off of Guadalcanal. But at any rate, we had one of the, we were a two propeller ship and one of the darn propellers was screwed up. It wasn't working right. And so when I got the crew together, I said, look, we've docked this ship a dozen times. You know exactly what to do. I won't have time, given the emergency of the bad uh, propeller, to tell you detail what to do. You know what to do. When I um, said, so we're going to bring the ship in, and you do what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to do it without hearing from me. And that's exactly what I did, and it worked perfect. And that was a classic example, I think, to demonstrate that they could do things on their own and uh, in, in a coordinated way, too. It seems like with an attitude like that, if Saul's, the Navy Saul's heard about it, they would just go, ah, you can't yeah, do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they had never got the ship docked. <laughs> but there was no way that I could bark the orders back that quick because we were coming in a real confined space. So you had to make a turn. You had to run certain revolutions on the engines and so forth. And I said, look, we've done this. Don't wait for me to tell you. Do it. <laughs> you see, and it worked. If circumstances, if you could go back and change circumstances like not go in the Navy or something like that. Would you change anything? Well, the main thing I, I would give a lot more attention to is uh, uh, strategy, battle strategy, even on a little ship. I think it saved our lives, the fact that I learned what the elements of the so-called crossing the T were and why it was important. Yeah. Theoretically, what it does, it gives you more firepower on, on the ship, uh, on the enemy ship. Wow. And, and so, but at any rate, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, learn the technology that can save lives. We, we had radar uh, on the ship, and uh, I gave priority to uh, uh, the guys that needed to service that equipment, so it was working all the time. Then, well, I'm looking at the time there, and we have reached our end of the tape. Good, Paul, good. thank you very, good. very much. This good. has been an extremely informative conversation. Well, I hope it gives an insight as to what life was really like. Uh, it does. Uh, on the, at the grassroots level. I think you had it better than uh, those of us that are in the Army. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. We, <laughs> we had to work with the Army. They were great. We, we carried lots of GI sometimes, but we weren't primarily a troop ship anymore. Maybe the ones that had it better were the Air Force. They, they might have. <laughs> but we worked with everybody in those days. Well, thank you very, very much. And you can stop that. Okay. Stop these guys. Oh, well, it's uh, fun. I, that's what I'm trying to write up. Now, we could. There you go.